The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Mark. The Spirit drove Jesus out into the wilderness, and he remained there for 40 days and was tempted by Satan. He was with the wild beasts, and the angels looked after him. After John had been arrested, Jesus went into into Galilee, And there he proclaimed the good news from God. The time has come, he said, and the kingdom of God is close at hand. Repent and believe the good news. The gospel of the Lord. Lord All these weeks after starting, and we're still in Mark chapter 1, eh? We haven't gone past Mark chapter 1. Very tight, but very involved at the same time. As we see the gospel reading today, it's customary that on the first Sunday of Lent, we reflect on on Jesus' temptations. And in Mark, we don't have these three temptations, which you'll find in Luke and in, in Matthew. But you do have some other pieces that are unique to Mark. The the first, as we we start, he he just starts very starkly. The spirit drove Jesus out into the wilderness, and he remained there for 40 days and was tempted by Satan. Y'all don't find that a little strange? Which spirit? Which spirit drove Jesus out there? So the text before this is the baptism, where during the baptism, the Holy Spirit comes down on Jesus like a dove, and and the Spirit and the voice from heaven says, this is my son, the beloved, listen to him. And so Jesus anointed with the Holy Spirit in baptism, and the next thing we hear is the Spirit drove Jesus out into the wilderness. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's the Holy Spirit that drives Jesus into the wilderness. Can you, can you hold on to that one for a moment? Can you hold on to that for a moment? You sure, huh? It's the Holy Spirit that dri- drives Jesus out into the wilderness. And I think if we understand this, we understand a lot about what we're doing in this season of Lent. The Spirit drove Jesus out into the wilderness, and he remained there for? And he was? Tempted by Satan. And now now you understand everything you need to know about Lent. Correct? By now, you already know that you are being tempted. Correct? You know, if you see it decided to give up cake, Oh, that carrot cake floating across your mind. It's so beautiful. It's the most beautiful carrot cake you have ever seen in your entire life. Not so? If it's alcohol, well, that, that glass that is shaking in front of you, is, you know, is just so compelling. Whatever you choose to give up, no matter what it is, that's the thing that seems most enticing to you by now. Am I correct? Yeah? You gave in yet? Come on. You giving us yet? Lent is really a most precious time. And it is the spirit that drives us into Lent. It is God's Holy Spirit that drives us into Lent. Because in, in this time, we are reminded of something that is most fundamental. That, that all of life, all of life is about spiritual warfare. And we don't like to talk about it that way, but it is true. We're not on, an, on a level playing field. You might notice already that, that the, the field is stacked and temptations come, and they come in a kind of a way that is so crazy that you can't even understand why. But here we have the Spirit drove Jesus out into the wilderness, and he remained there for 40 days and was tempted by Satan. 
In, in this part of the text, we have to hear our first reading from Noah, when Noah for 40 days was in the ark, and, and it rained for 40 days and for 40 nights. And for 40 days and 40 nights, Noah was tested by God. We also have to hear the people of Israel who, while Moses was up on Mount Sinai for 40 days, they were tested and they failed. They failed because they made an a, a idol, a, a molten calf out of gold, and, and they, they failed because they couldn't trust that Moses was still alive, and they couldn't trust that God was still with them, and therefore they went back to the idolatry that they knew while they were in Egypt, and, and in that moment of weakness, going back to the idolatry, when Moses comes down with the two tablets, the word of God, the ten words of God, the ten commandments, the people had already sinned against God. And so rather than the 40 days of testing they had while Moses was up the mountain, they had 40 years of wandering in the wilderness to learn something that is most precious and something that is most wonderful, to learn how to worship God, to learn how to put God first before everything else. And that's the reason of Lent, that we, are, we have this time to be tested so that we can learn how to put God first before everything and everyone else. And, and once we choose to do spiritual observance during Lent, we also will experience being tested. And if you have not experienced temp being tested yet in Lent, it's because you have not chosen yet to do spiritual practice. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. So if you're sitting in your chair and say, well, I don't know what you're talking about, you know, I ain't getting no set of temptation yet for Lent. That's a good thing. It means that you haven't yet chosen to do spiritual practice. And if you haven't found that temptation, it hasn't been terrible, it hasn't knocked you down, it hasn't given you grief, you haven't yet chosen to do spiritual practice. And you, guess what? This is a wonderful time to start choosing. A wonderful time to start choosing. Our, our reading goes on, you was tempted by Satan. Satan is the accuser who accuses the people of Israel, accuses Job, accuses the righteous, accuses those who, who have done well. And, and, and why, why, are we, why are we in this time of testing? Well, you know, the book of Ecclesiastes says, if you desire to serve the Lord, prepare yourself for an ordeal. Can you hear that? If you desire to serve the Lord, do what? Why? You know, we have this, this thing where we believe if you desire to serve the Lord, everything from then on in becomes easy. Ha. Ha, 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 ha. That is a joke. If you desire to serve the Lord, prepare yourself for an ordeal. Because wide is the road that goes to perdition. And narrow is the gate that goes to salvation. If you desire to serve the Lord, all of a sudden, all kinds of things that you never thought problems before start stirring up in your life. There's so many examples of people who have been away from God for long, long periods of time and, and come back and come to confession after 10, 20, 30, 40 years. And, and all of a sudden, what starts stirring in their hearts is, is not the grace that, that, is, that brought them to the moment of conversion. What starts stirring is all of the challenges and the tempting and the, and the temptations that are coming. Why? Because all of life, all of life is spiritual warfare. And if you're not experiencing it, is because you're not upping your game in serving the Lord. And if you're, if you're living a kind of mediocre kind of Christianity where everything is everything and you're just rolling around day by day and all is well and everything is well, then, then you're not going to experience it. 
but, but it is when you choose to serve God and you choose to up your game in Christianity, you choose to enter more deeply into prayer during this time of, of, of Lent, you choose to enter more deeply into fasting, you choose to enter more deeply into almsgiving, it is, it is when you up your game in, in the three spiritual practices that we've been offered that you experience being tempted. And that's not the time to run away and go back to the easy life. That's the time to smile and say, oh, 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 okay, I'll get you now. Lord, I need your mercy because hear what? I can't stand with this. I need you. And, and the point of the tempting is to put you right into that place where you know the absolute truth that you're not big enough, you're not bad enough, you're not brave enough, you're not courageous enough, you're not strong enough to stand before the temptation and not give in. You need God's mercy for love. You need God's care. And it is in that moment that you understand the truth of your need of God. And you can put your whole life into the hands of God and allow God to hold you in that hour of greatest need. Jesus in the garden cries out, Father, take this cup away from me. And then he says, Not but and that's the epitome of the, the one who is serving God. He prepare yourself an ordeal. He, he would have preferred not to have drunk from that cup. But he also preferred than that to do the will of God as opposed to doing his old will. And this is what Lent is about. It, it's about moving your spiritual life from wherever it was before this season to, to moving it up so that in the spiritual practices that you enter into during this Lenten season, you also come to that one knowledge that is the truth of all things. Without God's grace, we can do nothing at all. Nothing at all. And if you think you could live without God's grace, and if you think you're just fine and all is well, and you ain't know what he's talking about, it's because you're lived, living your life at a very low level of spiritual engagement. You're living as a, as a spiritual infant if you're not experiencing what I'm talking about. And it's the period of Lent is the time. Take the game up. Take it up. Take it up in your prayer. Take it up in your fasting. Take it up in your alms giving. Move your game up during this Lent so that during this time you come to know the truth of God's unfailing love for you. You also come to know how much you need his mercy for love. How much you need. Anytime someone has a deep conversion and, and starts moving towards God, they also start experiencing all sorts of temptations to move away and to go back to how it was before. Think about it. Think of a, a moment where you've had an encounter with God and everything seems so wonderful and wild and beautiful, and then think about what happened after, how, how the temptations came and, and how it was so much easier just to go back to where you were before. No, this is the time you take your game up. This is not the time to give in. This is the time to take the game up again and to move it to the next level. The passage goes on to say, he was with the wild beasts and the angels looked after him. A really curious text. He was with the wild beasts and? Well, many of the ancient com commentators see this as a reference back to Adam. Because the first one who, who was in a place where he was tempted was Adam. And Adam, standing in the garden, was tempted by Satan. The same Satan. Was tempted by Satan. And, and told, well, you know, oh God, 
the old man for the dirty man. He ain't know what he talking about. You know, if, if you eat this, you, you, you could just be, be nice and wonderful. Come now, man, eat the thing. And, and Adam gave in and ate. He gave in to the temptation. And giving in to the temptation, Adam turned the beautiful ecological system that was Eden, that was self-preserving, self -pres that needed no work from humans. He turned that beautiful, self-sustaining ecological system into a desert. And so Jesus finds himself in a desert because the whole of humanity, having been cast out from Eden, comes to that desolate place where our soul is thirsting for the living God. And thirsting for God, our soul is, and, and, and where can we find God, and how can we water our parched and, and, and dreary, drooping spirits? How? How can we? And, and, and Jesus is in the desert that Adam created when Adam gave in to sin. But the, only, the other thing, the connection with Adam, is that Adam too stood before the beast. Because he had create, God had created all these beasts and Adam was standing there before all of these beasts. But it says the angels ministered to him. The min angels ministered to him. There's a, one of the, the ancient Jewish texts that talks about the angels ministering to Adam in the garden. And, and that's why the commenters believe that this little cryptic reference is back to Adam and Jesus is the new Adam. In the, in the wilderness, why wilderness? Because we are not living in the fertile state of the Garden of Eden where we could walk in the cool of the evening before God anymore. Because Adam, Adam ended that by, by giving into temptation. And so we're reminded that there's a serious consequence for giving into temptation. We also reminded that Jesus stands there as the new Adam, and he does not give in to temptation. He does not give in to temptation. You know, one of the church fathers says that, you know, how can we talk about Jesus being tempted? Because he's God. How can God be tempted? Well, you have to understand temptation in three, in three moments. First is the suggestion. Well, you know that one. Huh? Come on. Wait, well, you don't know the suggestion? Oh, God, you think good, man. You know you want to do it. Come on. What's wrong with you? The suggestion. The second is the delight, where we start taking delight in, in the suggestion that has been proposed to us. And the third is the giving in and giving our will in to the temptation itself. So Jesus would have only experienced the first, the suggestion. He would not have gone to the delight where he starts ruminating on, on, on the temptation. And he certainly would not have gone to the, to the third phase where his will gives over to the temptation. For us, for us, come on, help me now. Help me now, go oh, help me now. Oh, you're looking very shy this morning. For us, one, two, three as quickly as possible. When the suggestion comes, and we have to remember this, especially during Lent. When the suggestion comes, all it is, is a suggestion. That's it, you know. It has no power, you know. All it is, is a suggestion. It starts now being more than that when you start to take. When you start, oh, oh you know about delight. Okay, good. That's good to know. When you start to take delight, when you start entering into the suggestion and moving it around in your mind. And it comes to full completion when your will gives in to that temptation and you start entering into it in your mind and acting as if it is real. We have to remember during Lent, when the suggestion comes, all it is is a suggestion. And if at that moment we have the spiritual insight to say, oh, ho, you're giving me a suggestion. Thank you. But no thanks. Not today. You know how much nicer our life could be? Come on. 
Yes or no? Huh? How much nicer our life could be? How many hours of foolishness we could save ourselves? All it is is a suggestion, you know. That's all it is. It has no more power except we give it power by moving it from suggestion to delight and then moving it from delight to a free act of our will. So during Lent, not only are we doing spiritual warfare, are giving you some tools to do this warfare with it. Take your game up. Take it up. Don't, don't remain where you were before Lent. And if you've not done anything to take your game up with prayer, fasting, and alms giving as yet, today, don't let today end without taking your game up. And remember, the suggestion is only, only a suggestion. That's all it is. Then Mark goes on, after John had been arrested, Jesus went into Galilee, and there he proclaimed the good news from God. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God is close at hand. Repent and believe the good news. And that's actually the formula that begins Lent. One of two formulas. Remember, you are dust and unto. Repent and believe the good news. These are the two formulas used to begin Lent. And, and, and really, this formula is really what Lent is most about. Repent. What does that mean? It, it literally means Finding out where, where God is asking or calling you to. So, so repentance is not just about the foolish suggestions that we turn to delight or acts of our will. It's not just about that. It's first and foremost, is your life heading in the direction that God is calling you? So it's about your vocation, first and foremost. What is your vocation? If you're married and you're living like a single... Well, hello. Hello. Wake up and recognize your life not heading in the right direction. If you're single and you're acting like you're married, hello. You're not heading in the right direction. So the first moment of, of repentance is asking yourself, is my life true to my vocation? So many times our life is true to our vocation, but the suggestions and the delights are kind of sideways movements that distract us from the general purpose or direction of our life. But sometimes the suggestions, the delights, and the, the acceptance of the will take us way away from the direction God is calling us. And the first moment or understanding of repentance is asking, what is my vocation? And am I living that and living it fully? I might be heading in the general direction. I might be in the right church, but I might be in the wrong pew. Then you get to the right pew. That's repentance. Or I might be in the wrong church. I might be in the wrong city. I might even be in the wrong continent. Then you need to move your life to where God is calling you and, and allow your life to be where God is asking you. That's repentance. Repentance. It's twofold. It's not just shifting your life to where God wants. It's also believing the good news. That is believing that Jesus Christ has overcome temptation in the desert. And that Jesus Christ has done more than that. As we read in our, in our second letter where, from Peter, where he says, Now it was, not, it was long ago when Noah was still building the ark which saved only a small group of eight people by water. <coughs> and when God was still waiting patiently, that the spirits refused to believe, that water is a type of baptism which saves you and which is not washing away physical dirt, but a pledge made by God and to God from a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has entered heaven and is at the right hand of the Father. And now he has made the angels and the dominions and the powers his subject. So the believing of the good news is believing that Christ has died. And, and in his death, he conquered death. 
Christ has been raised from the dead, and he sits at the right hand of the Father. We, we are not left to our own device when we are in temptation without the power that we need to live as Christians. We, we, we are being tempted, yes, here on earth, but, but we also have that one who had overcome temptation, up to death, death on a cross, who's sitting at the right hand of the Father. And if we call to him in the moment of our need, he has the power to free us from Satan's hole and the power to free us from temptation and the power to raise us up as sons and daughters of God. And that is who we are. The whole of Lent is coming to find out who we are. Ah, but we can't know that until we come to know who he is. By learning who he is and entering more deeply into relationship with him, we come to know who we are. Because you are a child of God. Amen.